Please welcome the President and CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota, Dr. Craig Semet. Good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's an honor to be here. Um, my primary role this afternoon is actually to introduce our next speaker, but I wanted to take a few minutes to say hello, introduce myself, really make a few comments about the awesome panel uh, that we just heard, um, and then certainly end with an introduction of our next speaker, and I'll, I'll do all of that in 10 minutes. Um, so I am 65 days in to my role here at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota, and I couldn't be prouder um, to be here in my home state, first of all, but to be part of what I believe Minova is all about. I've had the privilege and the honor throughout my career to work with organizations that are viewed as better, bolder, broader, um, organizations that have, have been impatient about how quickly we're moving in healthcare, how broken we still are as an industry, and how much progress we could make if we simply learned best practices, innovated the way that some of the best companies of the world innovate, and really focus on the consumer. Um, just a bit of background, uh, my career has been spent in integrated, partnership-oriented, value-based delivery systems. And the panel, for me, was actually a, a bit of a homecoming and, in, and, to some degree, a convergence of my prior lives. Uh, I did my, my residency uh, at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, uh, and I think that Leslie and I probably intersected a, at a common time there, but was part of Harvard Community Health Plan's team and Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare and Fallon Clinic, all organizations that we're passionate about driving our industry toward better care at a lower cost. Um, and then for seven years, I was the CEO of an awesome organization called Dean Health System uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. So uh, I got to get to know Sue Turney extremely well. Um, and now I'm here and a colleague of Penny Wheeler's uh, because I frankly believe there are no better states than Minnesota that could demonstrate that the quadruple aim is actually achievable, and we can put that into action. Um, it was fascinating for me to hear the, the last question of the panel. Uh, what is our biggest challenge, and what are we going to do about it? Um, so here's how I would have answered that question. Um, I think our biggest challenge is, is that we have spent decades in our industry admiring our problems. Um, I, I give a lot of talks about the imperative for transformation, and I have to say that I've been to way too many meetings that talk about how quality isn't high enough, how we're not, we're the only service business that doesn't act like one, and that our costs are unsustainably high. And we do a really good job talking about all those things and, and why I'm here in Minnesota and why I'm excited to be part of the team that you just heard uh, and part of Minova is because I actually think we should stop admiring our problems and that we should start fixing them. We've heard a lot of really good ideas today. Let's put them into action. I think the corrective action plan is for us to stop talking about these things and once and for all doing something about all the ways that we could make our industry different. And I, I did want to underscore this notion of better and bolder and broader and elaborate it on a little bit, a little bit more. Um, you know, frankly, uh, better is simply to deliver on the promise of better care at a lower cost. That shouldn't be so hard. Um, I had the chance to, um, to meet with uh, my customer service team this past week. Uh, and I'll share with you very candidly that Blue Cross Blue Shield Minnesota's net promoter score, first of all, is the best in the state of Minnesota, 
at a whopping plus 9.8. Now, providers are a little bit better. Um, pharmaceutical companies are far worse. Um, but Costco's net promoter score is 75. So isn't better care a possibility? Um, when we talk about putting the customer first, that's what customers want. I think we do know what customers want. Um, when, I, when I talk to my millennial colleagues at Blue Cross and I ask them what could make their work life better, their answer is, we want life here at Blue Cross to work the way life works for us with everything else we do in our lives at home. So I think consumers very simply want us to provide to them the same level of service, commitment, consistency, quality results that we would expect from just about any other industry that we work with. And I am bullish and I am confident that we can do this. I also just think that um, while Minnesota is one of the highest quality states in the nation, we have some of the greatest health inequities and our costs are unsustainably high. So we can't just deliver the numerator of the equation of value. We also have to deliver on the denominator. Um, and it's no wonder that organizations like Amazon and Target and other disruptive innovators look at our industry because they look at the results we're generating and feel that that is not enough. I think that we can do better. And if there's anything that I hope comes from meetings like this is I hope it's a call to action that we will actually work to be better. The bolder part for me is all about innovation. Um, I think to be better, we need to be different. And so I think hospitals should not be about maximizing census. Uh, it should not be about discharges. It should not be about admissions. Uh, if we were doing our job correctly and folks were well, we wouldn't need as many admissions. And while I also appreciate the comments of us not having enough doctors and caregivers, the reality is, is that if we were well and we focused like we say, that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, then perhaps if we were just a more well society, then we would actually have more than enough facilities, clinics, caregivers, and other settings um, to, to do our work. And so I do think we have to reinvent ourselves. Health plans need to be less about paying claims and having larger networks. And I think we need to be as much about being retail companies, care delivery companies, technology companies, analytic companies. Stella is Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota's parent corporation, and we established Stella with the notion of reinventing Blue Cross because we believe that we should play a very different role in transforming our industry by investing in, building, and partnering with a very different flavor of innovators that drives reinvention of our entire industry. We want to be at the forefront along with many other care delivery and plan and other disruptor colleagues in saying we cannot deliver better results by doing all the things we've always done. Um, in fact, one of the things I wanted to proudly announce today because Stella has several companies, Further, Clearstone, Livio, which is a care delivery company. Uh, tomorrow, we're announcing a capital investment in Ceresti, which is the first digital engagement platform to empower family caregivers and aging patients. What else can we do differently like that, but let's do it 100 times over that completely reinvents our industry? And then finally, the broader um, part of my comments are about the fact that I think we've disappointed our community. I talked about the fact that we have one of the highest quality, we are one of the highest quality states in the nation, and yet we have the highest health inequities. Social determinants of health, as we know, are an even greater driver of healthcare cost and illness than uh, what we do in the clinical world. And how much are we truly investing in loneliness, racial disparities, income disparities, 
transportation barriers, food insecurities, the things that we know that if we solved for would improve the health of our community. Um, and, and I think we need to do a whole lot more of that. In fact, no one part of our community can solve for how we need to be different than all of us. We need to do it together. And with that, um, I finally am very proud, proud and pleased to introduce our speaker because I think that his passion and his focus and his energies have very much been put into helping our industry be bolder and helping our industry be broader. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, David Perry, uh, President, CEO, and Director of Indigo Agriculture. David is a serial entrepreneur who's founded and built three innovative companies in the last 20 years, and I think he's actually going to be speaking about Indigo as well as uh, digital health startup, Better Therapeutics. Indigo Agriculture is focused on helping farmers sustainably feed the planet, ensuring customers, consumers, have access to healthy food and know its origin. Feeding the world's growing population in a sustainable way is the issue Indigo is tackling, and it is one of many ways that we should be playing different to be bolder, better, and broader in fixing our healthcare industry. It gives me great pleasure to introduce David Perry of Indigo Agriculture. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today. As Craig said, my day job is CEO of Indigo Agriculture, and that's what I do with 98% of my time. But today I'm going to talk about something that's related to Indigo that I think about a lot, which is how can we use systems thinking and systems entrepreneurship to address some of our biggest problems? So very briefly, I was born uh, in South Arkansas. I was raised on a farm, and that's what I did for the first part of my life. I then went on to get a chemical engineering degree and an MBA, and I've spent the last 20 years of my life starting and running technology-based businesses. Most recently, uh, Anacor Pharmaceuticals, which, uh, which Pfizer purchased in 2016. And that gave me the opportunity to sort of step back and and think about what I wanted to do differently or what I wanted to do next. And I, I had the emerging conclusion that there's an opportunity for entrepreneurship to really impact some of the biggest problems we face in the world. And the conviction that one of those problems is how we're choosing to eat and what the result of that is on our health. And the result of that thinking is better therapeutics. So I'll start before I talk about better therapeutics with, with a graph of some data. The black line here is US healthcare spending since 1965. In 1965, it was less than $200 billion, which sounds like a big number, until you consider today that it's $3.7 trillion. It's hard for most of us to think in trillions, but to put it in perspective, the gross domestic product of the United States is about 19 trillion. So we're spending 20% of all of our efforts, all of our goods and services produced as a country on healthcare. If we were getting a great result, maybe that would be a good trade-off. But the blue graphs, the bar graphs here, represent the number of patients diagnosed with diabetes which have also gone from a relatively small number in 1965 to over 20 million today. I used diabetes here, but I, it's only a proxy for any number of metabolic diseases that would all show the same graph. In fact, for the first time in the last few years, we're actually starting to see a decline in, um, in life expectation. So with all the discussion today about where we are and what we need to change, one thing we can say with absolute certainty is this will not continue. We cannot possibly afford to continue to spend more and more money for a worse and worse outcome. 
costs are growing at 5% a year. 10 years from now, that'll be $7 trillion if nothing changes. And our GDP is going to start to decline because we won't be healthy enough to continue to produce. To, to put a finer point on this, and this was mentioned in earlier talks today by, uh, by Sam Cass and by Dan Buettner, the vast majority of that spending comes from three diseases, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease or dyslipidemia. So about 80% of that 3.7 trillion, or $3 trillion, comes from diseases that are preventable. They are largely the result of our lifestyle choices, what we eat and how we choose to live. Just let that sink in for a moment. We are spending $3 trillion a year to treat the symptoms, but not the underlying causes, of diseases that are caused only by our own choices. And we could choose to just prevent them instead. Imagine how much better that would be. How much money we would save as an economy, how much that would improve patients' livelihoods, how much that would improve our productivity, and how much more money we could invest in treating diseases that, that aren't preventable. So there's obviously a lot of innovation going on in these diseases today. New drugs for these, new ways of, of uh, keeping patients on therapy. But I think of all of those as incremental changes. They're valuable, necessary, but they're not going to fundamentally change the result. What would fundamentally change the result is if we could keep people from getting the diseases in the first place. And the good news is we can. The fact is that if we do five simple things, we can prevent the majority of these diseases in the first place. We can eat a healthy diet that's pri primarily based on plants. We can maintain a healthy weight. We can be reasonably active. Three or four times a week and about 20 minutes a day is sufficient and walking counts. We need to not smoke and we should drink alcohol only in moderation. So how many people today do all five of those? If I relieved the constraint of only drinking alcohol in moderation, how many would come in? That's, that's more like it. Uh, so we know how to solve the problem. It's not really what should we do, it's how do we get people to change their behaviors to do it. So Dan Buettner would, would wrap culture and care around this. You know, reinforcing healthy behaviors by having individuals who care for and help reinforce those good behaviors and putting you in an environment where it's easier to, uh, to do these things. I think that's going to be a really important tool. Another important tool is going to be software, specifically prescription software. We normally think of prescriptions as drugs, chemotherapeutics, you know, physical things. But it turns out that for many diseases that require um, a change of behavior, software might actually be a much better way of treating it than a chemotherapeutic is. So for things like alcohol dependence, uh, smoking cessation, ADHD, and now metabolic diseases, companies are working with the FDA to develop software applications that will take through randomized clinical trials, get approval as a prescription from the FDA, and physicians can write that prescription to change the patient's underlying behavior as opposed to starting with a drug. Specifically, Better Therapeutics is an app on people's phone, and it reinforces good behaviors like uh, eating well, exercising regularly, and helps train the, the patient on how to do those things, including shopping lists, menu planning, cooking skills, and so forth. Software, it turns out, is incredibly good at changing behavior. We know this from Facebook. We know it from Uber. We know it from video games. We know it from Fitbit. It's much better at changing behavior, for example, than a once a quarter visit to the doctor's office where the doctor will spend three or four minutes telling you you should eat better. The average patient interacts with better therapeutics 11 and a half times a day. 
We've seen this work in clinical trials. And so in both diabetes and in high blood pressure, we see a reduction over 12 to 16 weeks that is roughly the same as what you would get if you were taking a leading drug. So just as effective as in a drug. There's three or four important differences. One is that all the side effects are positive. Patients report weight loss, higher energy, greater sense of health and purpose. Two is cost. It costs a lot less to get a patient to change their behavior than it is to keep them on the drugs. Three is that applications get better and better. One of the beauties of software and data sciences is that the more data you have, the more data you have to write better algorithms and improve your machine learning, which allows you to offer a better service, which allows you to have more data, and so forth. It's a self-reinforcing problem. And finally, unlike drugs, so we'll get cheaper and cheaper. As you have more data, it costs less and less to serve each extra patient. Drugs are going up 5 to 10% a year. The cost of better therapeutics and other prescription therapeutics like it will go down year over year. And as a result of that, we've gotten a lot of early interest from um, insurers like Blue Shield of California and Blue Cross, Blue Cross of North Carolina. So that's better therapeutics. And that addresses the thought that if we could change pe people's behavior around how they interact with food, we could prevent a lot of these diseases. They went on to realize that we also need to improve the quality of our food. And that leads us to indigo agriculture. And this is the company where I spend the majority of my time. Just a brief uh, facts on indigo agriculture. We're only four years old. In that time, we've hired about 550 people. We've raised $650 million in um, private equity. We're primarily headquartered in Boston, but we have offices uh, elsewhere in the US and in Brazil, Argentina, and Australia. Why agriculture? Well, one is it's because it's one of the largest industries in the world. It's fourth, fifth, or sixth on any given year, depending on what ag prices are, et cetera. And it's arguably the most important industry in the world. Every single one of us and every single person on Earth depends on its output, output multiple times per day. 40% of the world's population is engaged in agriculture and makes their living from it. And yet it's really the last of the large industries to be impacted by new technologies and new business models. And change in agriculture is desperately needed. For one thing, agricultural productivity is declining or plateauing. People who think about this stuff think there, there'll be about 10 billion people in the world by 2050, so just 30 years from now. And those people will require about 70% more food than we're producing today. Today, agricultural productivity is growing at about 1% a year, so that's not going to get us there. The only way we're going to feed the growing population is through new innovations in technology and business models. Second is that the technologies that got us to this point are not really the ones we want to take forward. You know, agriculture today is really based on the use of chemicals, synthetic fertilizer, uh, genetic technologies, GMOs, and plant breeding and the resulting seeds. And we know things like synthetic fertilizer require an enormous amount of energy to produce. Then when it's spread on the land, a lot of that runs off and pollutes local rivers and streams as well as oceans. Um, agricultural chemicals have uh, threats to both wildlife and to humans. There, it's not that those technologies were bad. When they were created, they were the best we could do. But we now have the opportunity to do better and replace those technologies with things that are fundamentally more sustainable and healthier. Our current commodity system doesn't really support consumers' increasing desire for transparency and traceability. And finally, most farmers aren't making much money. And that's especially true with today's commodity prices. So how can that be, one might ask? You've got a gigantic industry. You've got clear need for change. Why hasn't it changed? 
would argue that there are two reasons. One is, today, in agriculture is organized into silos. There are big input companies, seed companies and chemical companies that we all know the name of. They sell through farm retailers to 2.2 million farmers who then sell to grain companies, et cetera. Because each of them is siloed, they're all optimizing the outcome within their own particular area. But nobody really has the perspective or the incentive to think about agriculture as a system to solve the entire problem. The second reason is commoditization. You know, for the first 10,000 years of agriculture, farmers knew exactly who their customers were. It was them, their family, the local community. But the turn of the 1900s, we had to change that system. People were moving off of farms and into cities, and we had to figure out how to get food from where it was grown to where it was consumed. And so we commoditized it. We said, if you produce a bushel of wheat and it meets these certain specs, we'll, all, we'll pay you all the same thing. And that'll allow multiple farmers to pile their grain together and ship it in rail cars, et cetera. Again, nothing wrong with that. It allowed us to feed the entire US and a good portion of the world. It just doesn't meet our needs anymore. Because as long as a farmer is producing a commodity, a bushel of wheat, it's impossible for them to get paid for better quality or producing that bushel with better sustainability. And if they don't have any economic incentive to do that, then they don't adopt the technologies that could allow them to. And so fundamental to changing agriculture is changing this dynamic. We have to decommoditize agriculture. So Indigo steps in here. We think of our mission as harnessing nature to help farmers sustainably feed the planet. And there are three pillars to that mission, increasing farm profitability, improving the environmental sustainability of agriculture, and improving farm practices consistent with better consumer health. We do four things to do that. First is we bring new technologies that, that increase farm, profit, um, sorry, farm productivity. So microbiology and data sciences have enormous potential to improve productivity and, and move us towards being able to feed a growing population. Second, we've launched what we call Indigo Marketplace, a gigantic e-commerce platform that directly connects farmers with the buyers of their grain. It's only been online for four months. In that time, we have almost seven and a half billion dollars worth of inventory that farmers have put onto that marketplace and we have about half a billion dollars worth of open bids from buyers today looking for specific kinds of grain in specific areas. The success of Indigo Marketplace has the potential to decommoditize agriculture and create the incentives that can allow for all these other changes. Third is we have to be able to segregate and trace grain. So, Today, there are two large types of buyers of corn, and number two, yellow corn, is probably the biggest commodity in agriculture today. Most of it gets used either by ethanol plants or for, by feed facilities. They are both buying exactly the same kind of corn, but it turns out they want different things. High carbohydrate corn is better to turn into ethanol. High protein corn is better to feed to animals. By simply segregating it, testing it, and sending the each quality to the buyer who's willing to pay the most for it, we create an enormous amount of value for farmers, even the, if we haven't changed the overall quality of the, of the crop. And then finally, ultimately, nature, a combination of microbiology and a better understanding of data sciences, is going to dramatically decrease the amount of fertilizer and agricultural chemicals used in farming both benefiting the farmer by lowering their cost and benefiting the environment and consumers by making it more sustainable and, uh, and healthier. So here's how we think about Indigo. It's, it is meant to be a system solution. We recognize that if we, when we started as a microbiology company, if we wanted to just be a microbiology company, our impact was gonna be necessarily limited. We could have some positive impact, but we couldn't make a fundamental change to agriculture. And so we instead 
decided to do the other, which is envision the world that we thought was possible, sort of the ideal solution, and see if we could put it in place. It is an enormous undertaking, and the story is still being written, um, but it's possible. And if we're successful, we'll have an enormous positive difference in the world and create a very, very valuable company in the process. And so that gets me to what I really want to talk about, which is the ability, perhaps, to address some of our largest problems with systems innovation. So as human beings, we're taught to understand and solve problems consistent with the left-hand side of this slide. We start by breaking those problems down in pieces, and then normally we address them or solve them the same way. For example, if somebody has a bacterial infection, we figure out what kind of bacteria is causing it. We understand the details of that bacteria and how it works. We design a chemical to kill that bacteria and address the infection by, by administering an antibiotic. It's reductionist science, understanding a single cause, a single effect, and a single solution. Part of the reason that we do that is the human brain is capable of thinking that way. Systems are much more complicated. An example would be farming. So in an average crop year, a farmer needs to make about 100 decisions. You know, what crop or crop mix am I going to plant? What kind of seeds should I use? How densely should I plant them? How deep should I plant them? How much fertilizer should I use? If, if each of those 100 decisions have 10 reasonable possibilities, then what the farmer is dealing with is a deci decision matrix that has 10 to the 100th power possible answers. So that 10 to the 100th power is the mythical number called Google. It's the, it's the basis for the company named Google, and it's thought to be roughly the number of atoms in the universe. It's well beyond what any human brain can, can, can handle. But it's not beyond what we can now handle with advanced processing, data sciences, machine learning, and algorithms. We now have an increasing ability to collect all of that data because sensors are getting cheaper and cheaper and more available. So we can collect data on soil quality. We can look at crops through drones. We can look at crops from space. Indigo today collects about one terabyte of data every day. And then we can store, organize, and make sense of that data so that farmers for the first time can actually have database solutions to a database problem. So systems thinking applies to both biology and business. Historically, biological innovations have been re reductive in nature. So I'm going to create an antibiotic to treat an infection. I'm going to create a statin to lower uh, cholesterol. What if instead we understood human health well enough to get ahead of that problem, to actually manage health rather than disease so that they never got to the point where they needed the antibiotic or the statin? And the same is true in agriculture. We've managed agricultural problems by creating insecticides to kill insects, fungicides to kill fungi. But there's a much better opportunity. It's to manage agriculture as an ecosystem, improve soil health, so that we don't have to add nitrogen fertilizer, and so that the pests of insects and disease are much less prevalent. And I think this sort of thinking applies to business and our large societal problems as well. You know, as much innovation as technology has enabled over the last two decades, almost all of those innovations are iterative or single point in nature. They've done great stuff. Like, I can walk out of the building and order a car, and it will show up within a few minutes. It is much better. But it won't solve these sort of problems, problems like how can we change education so that it applies to everyone and allows us to keep up? How can we improve healthcare outcomes while lowering cost? How can we feed a growing population in a more sustainable way? 
These are the sort of problems that require systems thinking, but increasingly the technology exists to allow it. From the perspective of an entrepreneur, that is both you know, intriguing and terrifying. Uh, the good news is that we can take on much bigger problems and have a much bigger impact. The obvious challenge is these things are hard to execute. You know, it's one thing to understand the needs in a system, it's another thing to put everything in place to make it work. But I would argue that from an entrepreneurial perspective, it's mostly an opportunity. It's different than the way a lot of entrepreneurs think. Uh, we often think, I need to define my problem small enough so that the execution risk seems small. So I'll be con able to convince people to invest in me because they think I'll be successful. What I'm arguing for is the opposite. Let's take our biggest problems and create bold, idealized solutions to those. Some people will be turned off by that, but my experience is that is that for the most part, that's beneficial. It attracts capital from people who want to create those kind of solutions and reap the rewards associated with it. It attracts employees who are excited to work on a mission-focused company. And it attracts early partners and early customers who are aligned with that mission. So I'll leave you with a quote from Buckminster Fuller. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Thank you very much.